Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for making time to be with us today. Um, my name's Emma. I'm the Chief Executive of the British Beer and Pub Association and it is fair to say that we've been on one hell of a roller coaster these last 14 weeks in the beer and pub sector. Uh, we have been dealing uh, with, you with full crisis management as many of you may have as well um, since, uh, since March and it has been interesting to see how events have unfolded. It has been heartbreaking to hear some of the stories, um, but we're just trying to keep the positivity to hope that we can find the road to recovery. And uh, this is what we're here to do, to listen to business, to support businesses, to see them through this moment in time. So a lot of my days I'm on the phone with government at the moment, uh, as well as all of the members of the BBPA, uh, trying to understand how we can get them on that road to recovery which will be long, but uh, we've got some first steps and good news that's happened this week. So for me, um, that's what I've been doing and the, uh, the things that are right in front of me right now. Great, thanks and I'm sure you've been extremely busy and will continue to do so. Sasha, Sasha, can I introduce you please? Yeah, so my name is Sasha Lord. Thanks for inviting me today. Um, I wear a couple of hats. So um, as an operator, I'm behind Parkland Festival and the Warehouse Project, but I'm also the Nighttime Economy Advisor for Greater Manchester. Um, clearly, Park Life didn't happen this year. You know, we, it was, we were gutted about it. We were on for our fastest sellout to date. We'd sold 78,000 tickets in March. Our capacity is 80,000. So... Um, yeah, you know, for us, it was, we were, it was a very sad time, but we had to adapt very, very quickly. And I was contacted by many freelancers, many operators who actually had fallen through the gaps with help uh, from the government. And to be honest, they did do some really good things back in January, February. I didn't even know what the word furlough meant, as I think many people didn't. Um, and they had put some really good support in there, but there wasn't enough support. So... Um, I came up with an idea called United We Stream, and then the idea was to entertain people within their homes during lockdown, but also to raise funds as well uh, for, for people who needed it within the nighttime economy and hospitality across Greater Manchester. Um, and we had 15 million people tune in over a 10 week period, and we've raised just under half a million pounds, which has gone out extremely quickly. Um, I have been slightly frustrated this week. It's, it's extremely good news that hospitality is opening in some format next Saturday. Uh, I think whoever's advised to open on a Saturday, is, 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 they, they clearly aren't an operator. It would have been much better, in my opinion, to open on a Thursday and get used to the measures in place rather than a, a big day like a Saturday. Um, but it's going to be interesting. It's, it's positive. Uh, it's a positive move. I think it's going to send out a lot of confidence um, it's going to be interesting to see how many people actually do go out next Saturday. Um, I personally have my own gut feelings that people are going to stay very local as opposed to heading out using public transport. That's, that's coming back to me on the surveys. But it's a, a positive move. I think they could have given us a bit more time, to be honest. Um, but hey, you know, we can't be picky with that. Thank you very much for that, Sasha. And, you know, 78,000 tickets. Wow, that's, uh, that's some feat, isn't it, in its own. Um, William, William Robinson, can I introduce you to the panel, to, the, to the, our guest now, please? Yes, um, thank you, Helen. Um, yes, thank you all for coming and listening to us today. I hope that we can give you a bit of useful insight from our experiences. Uh, I'm William Robinson. I'm Joint Managing Director of Robinson's Brewery in Stockport. Um, and we're a sixth generation family business um, run by Oliver, my cousin and myself. Um, clearly, when this all hit, I mean, it was a, like a train hitting the industry and like a train hitting our business. And the first time in our country in history, that, that was a massive challenge we all had to face into and all had to face up to. And I think the support that we've had from Emma and her team, and we've been in touch with Sasha as well in the background, all the support we've had has been huge and really valuable, not just for us, but for the pub sector as a whole. And I think that needs to be recognised. This has been about everyone coming together. And that's perhaps one of the best things we've seen out of this whole horrendous period is the way that everyone has come together, everyone has mucked in together and tried to do the right thing and lobby in a, in a consistent way to get, on the whole, I think, a fair package. Sasha's right, some people have fallen through the gaps, and that is very unfortunate. And we did try to patch some of the gaps up. Some we succeeded, some we didn't. Um, 
I think we're very conscious as we move into the reopening phase that uh, hubs are, are not a necessity purchase, they're an experience purchase and we have to make sure that those experiences are maintained and that customers feel welcomed in a, uh, and are given hospitality that they deserve and that we wish to provide for them. When I look at the closure period and how that's worked, I just am immensely proud of all the work our licensees have done to support their communities, to pop up shops, to all the other bits, whether it's rooms, the NHS, I'm actually at the Bulls Head Hale Barns today, where we turned over the lodge to the NHS for the duration of the COVID period. I think there's been so many great things that pubs and hospitality on the whole have done that's to be really applauded, and that mustn't be um, missed at the end of all this. We're all delighted to reopen. Sasha's right, you know, opening on a Saturday, no operator will choose that day of the week, but it's what we've got. Uh, I think we have to be careful, I was talking to our general managers earlier, that you know, we've got to be mindful if the Saturday forecast is as it is now, which is hot, we're all going to have to take a really responsible attitude to make sure that from our point of view as operators and from the customer's point of view, that everyone behaves in a really responsible way and gets off on the right footing. It will be a very, very tough day for operators. And I think it's just one of those ones where I'd applaud anybody who goes in, just bear, bear with the teams. They won't have had any training for this. They're trading in a new environment, totally untested. They will all rise to the challenge. I know they will, and we've got some fantastic licensees and fantastic members of staff, but it's going to be a tough one. And we, of course, talk about England opening on the 4th of July, but Wales still isn't open, and we don't have a date yet for pubs to reopen in Wales. So for those on this call who perhaps holiday in North Wales, watch this space. We're keeping pushing, and I know Emma and her team have been on calls today to support us in getting Wales reopened and having a timeline. Um, I think the, the final point I'll make is obviously during the pandemic, clearly the pub side of the business has been closed, but we do a lot of contract work and contract bottling out of our breadbury site. So we've brewed throughout the whole lockdown period. A tribute to our teams who've been coming in to do that and have been packaging and bottling. And our line, a bit of good news is our line is actually full. We can't take any more bottling contracts until the end of September. Well, that's certainly some good news that's come out of that and I think also I think we can all um, take lessons lessons that have learned everything we, I think there have been some good outcomes that have come through this period and I think we need to take those with us as we do move forward whatever they happen to be and they're different they affect us all in different ways and they're all different for different sectors but but you're absolutely right you know um, we can take some lessons out of all this and move on with them um, Ian, Ian O'Donnell Hi everybody, I'm Ian O'Donnell uh, from Stockport Council. I'm the Head of Public Protection. I uh, cover a wide range of services, but uh, in particular for this call, uh, I'm responsible for licensing, uh, obviously around alcohol and premises licenses, uh, and also for environmental health and health and safety. And that's become really important over these last three or four months because a lot of the legislation and regulations that have come in around coronavirus have been under Health and Safety at Work Act, which we um, enforce for particularly for a lot of the licensed premises. So the teams have been incredibly busy during these last um, few months, even though like, a lot of the licensed premises, sorry, licensed premises have been closed. We've had that remit across the whole of businesses. So lots of queries from the public, uh, from the trade, from all sorts of people about different businesses, about how they can operate. And also, like a lot of you, having to operate in a very, very fast-moving environment. Legislation guidance is changing all the time. Obviously, businesses want to know how it applies to them. So a big challenge for us is to be able to take the information that's coming from central government and, and advise and interpret that. So obviously, a lot of that has been going on the last 24 hours following the guidance that's been issued. For me, our, our role has been to support businesses as much as we can. Yes, we have an enforcement role, but my view is that the vast majority of businesses want to get on with things and want to look after their customers, their staff, and want to operate responsibly. So I see our role as being supportive there. Yes, if there are instances where people don't want to do what's said in the guidance, and we've had some instances in the last couple of months of businesses who shouldn't be open, trying to open, yes, we'll enforce there from that public health and public safety point of view. Uh, that's certainly the approach that we've adopted throughout this and will continue as we move into the next stage of uh, opening from the 4th of July. Okay, thanks Ian. I think there's a few issues with your line. I think Richard's going to get, just get in contact with you just to try and sort those out, but but we'll we'll move on if we may. So if we lose you off screen, we know that you're coming back and you're there somewhere. 
Um, Emma, can I come to you first of all, please? Because I think it's really important for people to understand uh, what value the hospitality industry has as far as the UK economy is concerned. So this might be sort of a finger in the air for you at the moment, but I'd be interested to know, in terms of value to the UK economy and for your members, what would you say is, is the true impact of the coronavirus currently on your sector? The whole of hospitality employs 3.5 million people in the UK and the beer and pub sector is just under a million of that on its own. Um, and we contribute as a as the sector of beer and pub sector, you know, 23 billion to the economy. Um, we create one in every six jobs uh, in the United Kingdom. We are the third largest employer in the country. And the reality being uh, that all of that is at risk. So, you know, the jobs are economic contribution um, and those businesses, uh, particularly throughout this period of closure, we will have already lost some of those businesses, unfortunately for good, and some of those jobs will go. Now we're desperately trying to find a reopening, we get that on the 4th of July, but we all know that it's going to take a long time to rebuild confidence with our consumers. So of course, bringing back staff in from furlough on a part-time basis flexibly over that period of time as we grow that trade again, hopefully that will help stave off more job losses um, as we move forward but we contribute massively and that's why as a sector I think we're very often under some and that we need to get more traction particularly to help us you know people talk about wanting to um, you know see a, a revival of the high street in the hearts of our towns and cities um, you know and that is in and around the offers that we put out there you know people we are destination magnets now, you know, because of what we provide in those areas. And, and that is also at risk, is the footfall that we generate that has that knock on impact um, across high streets and in towns and cities as well. So when the hospitality offer is open, hopefully everyone will feel that impact across retail and, and boosting in other areas as well. So it, it is very difficult for us um, right now to, to see um, how we can get back to normal. Uh, so we will be having an altered experience in our pubs and there'll be an alternate offer out there. And we just have to hope that there is traction uh, and patience and confidence from our consumers to come back. And yeah, it won't be quite the same as it was before, but they want to support their local businesses and it will be crucial to, for our long term survival. But in terms of um, our trade rebuilding, some of our members, we're looking at nearly a year to get anywhere near back to normal trading. So whilst we've got to start to reopen and we'll hopefully be um, seeing some nearly 80% of our pubs opening now that it's reduced to one meter, it's still a long road to recovery to know exactly when we'll be able to feel, yep, yeah, you know, we're secure now. Um, so we really need long-term investment from the government to help us get there. Um, long-term commitment from our consumers to, to stick with us um, in the hope that we can actually survive because we all know we need part of the summer in order to go through the dark when um, months ahead, um, then it's an even longer journey from there. But um, if the government wants us to still be that job creator, if it still wants us to be that economic contributor, then it's gonna have to recognize and give us incentives to help us rebuild business, but also to support us in the long run. Yeah, well, thank, thank you very much for that. Now, I think your industry actually do employ an awful lot of young people as well, don't they? So it's really important that they are given the opportunities, you know, to, to, to get on the job job ladder and to continue through that. And and, and the hospitality industry, Williams pubs, etc. They're, they're a lifeline to so many people in the community. I think um, I think there's it's it's more than an economic desire. It's a it's a it's almost a health. It's a social social um, fixture, isn't it as well? Um, William, can I just come on to you, please? Um, how well do you think the government has supported the sector and handled the situation within the hospitality industry? I think the only way you can answer that, Helen, is you've got to contextualise when the decisions were made and what was known at the time the decisions were made. You can't look back with hindsight and say, could you have done this, could you have done that? There have been gaps. I referenced them a minute ago. I mean, pubs or hospitality venues of 51,000 and above on rateable values, they've fallen into a really nasty hole. And they're some of the best businesses, the strongest businesses we have, and yet they've had no grant support. And, and a lot have taken bounce back loans, and some of those loans are really quite substantial when you tie it all together. Um, I think the other thing that I would encourage the government to do on this is to look forward, Emma's just referenced it, 
I'm a firm believer that the government now should be considering extending the rates um, holiday period into 2021-2022 so that as businesses begin to recover everybody gets the ability to come back i think it will be it's you know 18 months two years three years you know everyone on this call will have their own view on how long it will take but for sure it's probably going to take longer than we all expect and that long-term support now we can't look back we've got to look forward so what leaves can be pulled now well there's long -term support there. there's vat other tools the government deploying on a, especially on a segmented basis uh, but you know by and large the government has listened i think the way they've extended the furlough scheme the part-time furlough and the other pieces are a huge support for our sector i worry that as we get to october that we may need to encourage them to extend it further because depending on where we get to and everyone talks about a second wave or what the autumn will bring the seasonal flu etc we can't be ignorant of that we can't be ignorant that our pubs in the more tourism locations, you know, the, the months we've just lost are the months that often put the cash in the bank that runs through the winter. Um, they're still going to need support or they will have to let people go or they may not survive. Neither of those are good options. We spend a lot of time training our employees and our teams and our licensees do as well so that the best they can be you know, and how to deal with these circumstances. It would be very regrettable as we get towards the end that they have to let them go and can't maintain that skill and knowledge. And the under 25s, we employ a lot of under 25s in our managed pubs. Um, it is that generation that we can support to grow their career in hospitality or indeed in other uh, fields as well. Hospitality is a great opportunity for people to build life skills. And I think it's really important we do all we can to protect that. But, you know, I guess the truth to the answer is nothing would ever have been enough. But what we've had, I think, has been very supportive and very welcome. But there's a few plugs or holes that I think could still be plugged to help the sector as we move on. I think, yeah, I think that's, I'll, I'll just go back and as I say, just have a look at the um, the, the, the new uh, Stockport Local Authority Discretionary Grant Scheme because I think that some, that might that might help some of the um, some of the people with the rateable values that didn't fall into the first two. Um, Sasha, if I may turn to you, last last year Stockport was very very proud to have been awarded the purple flag. Uh, a lot of it because of what it what it offers as a as a leisure destination and its nighttime economy. Um, and here in Stockport, a lot has been done to increase visitor numbers and improve the hospitality um, offering, especially re reinvigorating the, the evening and nighttime. How confident are you that, that can, that the nighttime economy can recover? Because I think there's going to be at the moment, there's things like nightclubs are obviously not allowed to reopen for obvious reasons. So how long do you think that, that it's going to take? I know you, you, you're completely right. And, you know, I back up everything that both William and Emma have said. Um, going into this pre-COVID, I was talking very much about the traditional high street dying away. And we know the reasons for that, the likes of, of Amazon, etc. And I'm at fault. I'm, I don't be, want to be a hypocrite. You know, I sit at home on a Sunday night to order shaving firm, and I know it's going to arrive in the post on the Tuesday. But we were seeing the traditional pubs, the nighttime economy, cropping up the high streets. We look at Ultram as the perfect example. I think Stockport were doing an incredible job. Um, especially in the old town, it felt to me like something extremely, extremely special was happening. So this just came at completely the wrong time. So we've sent a couple of surveys out um, from Greater Manchester. The first one was in the first three weeks. And the, one of the questions was, you know, when you're given a date, will you be going out? And 90% of the people were saying yes, most definitely. Actually, we put the same survey out again two weeks ago, and it now feels more 50-50. There are two different camps of people, most definitely. You've got your 18 to 25 year olds who next Saturday will run out of that back door quicker than Usain Bolt. They're not going to care. And then there are people more middle-aged like myself who will who want a bit more confidence, stay local. William, I'm a neighbor of where you are at the moment. I'll probably be walking in there next Saturday. I notice you're getting your, your beer garden ready. But you know, I think, we certainly, um, as operators, we're going to have to convince members of the public that we are taking steps. And also as well, you know, we're talking about customers, customers, customers the whole time. I think just more importantly than that is actually um, confidence within our staff. 
You know, we really have to support the staff, many who have been in lockdown for 12 weeks. You know, going off on a tangent, but I do suspect when they come back, we'll have to protect them slightly more than usual. They may have mental health issues, I don't know. You know, so I think we're going to have to really start not that we haven't, but really care for the staff and, and walk them through this. It's going to take leadership uh, to, to get through this period. So to answer the question, I think, um, well, I've explained the two camps. I'm absolutely convinced from the survey that people will stay local to begin with. That's all ages. I think the hardest place to actually get back up and running will probably be the city centre where you have to take public transport taxis i think people will want to support the local pub walk down the road and, and yeah just stay local so this could actually be a really good time for our town centres and villages to shine thank you very much it's very good points but there i haven't really considered the fact of how how by staying local again we're just working on a big campaign in stockport which is all about supporting the local economy the local environment with one stockport so yeah it's a very good point you've made there. um just had a um, a, a question put to us from uh, from our guests uh, and i guess it's for for both ian and sasha um have Stockport and indeed other Greater Manchester Borough Councils looked at issuing free street serving licences and or outdoor furniture grants like Liverpool Council and if not are there any plans for increased pedestrianisation of streets the European Cafe of Culture kind of kind of say can I can I come to you first Ian because you're on the licensing side I guess that you're best placed to to answer that mm -hmm. yes um, we've been putting a lot of work into Firstly, work out just what what permits and what licences are in place. It's a pretty complex position with when you consider that there are pavement cafe licences, uh, premises licences, and also planning arrangements and planning conditions. Um, just to say that one of the things that we still think may happen is there could be some deregulation. There's been talk throughout this about uh, deregulation. It wasn't mentioned in the guidance yesterday, but it's been trailed in the media today that there'll be an act going through Parliament that'll lift some of these um, provisions. So, short and since we don't know exactly what it's going to be like for the 4th of July yet, but certainly within Stockport, yeah, there's consideration to the fees that will be charged. No final decision on that yet, but yeah, consideration of how much we're going to charge people uh, and also to be as flexible as we can. I've got to say, we are constrained a bit by legislation in this respect, certainly in terms of licensing. If somebody wants to operate in an area that they aren't licensed for, as it stands, and I'm saying this at kind of half past two on Thursday, people would still have to go through some kind of licensing process. That may change, and it may change tomorrow, it might change next week. It will make it a lot easier for people if it did change, uh, but at the moment, what we've said is that we'll help people through that process as much as we can. Uh, we've also looked at other areas that we could use where pubs and bars haven't got uh, outdoor seating areas. Again, that work's still ongoing. A lot of this has been done at fairly short notice. Um, what we haven't got yet is somewhere that we can say, yes, this is where I'll be open and people can use. I think a lot of our pubs seem uh, happy to use their existing beer gardens and so and obviously where where they've not got somewhere that's where we need to still do a bit of work is, is, is that a general sort of situation across greater manchester sasha yeah so um just to, to back up what ian's just said so firstly you know i've had conversations with ian I've had conversations with elise wilson leader of stockport and generally across greater manchester the authorities are going to take a really pragmatic approach um, which is fantastic to see, and it's the first time in 26 years of being a to myself I've seen such a, a positive response because they really want to get it up and running. Um, I don't think I'm going to get myself in, into trouble for announcing this. I, I'm, I, well, if I am, it won't be the first time I, I get myself into trouble, <laughs> which is quite often. But on Monday, there is an act that's been rushed to Parliament um, regarding, uh, it's a COVID act regarding outdoor seating, tables, chairs, being allowed outside the venues and in public realm as well. They're also talking about pop-up cafes, pop-up bars, because at the moment, as most people know, if you apply for a license, it takes up to 28 days. And then if there is literally one objection, it could be another six weeks before you go to a hearing. 
and we just don't have that time. So from my understanding from what I've read this morning, this is cutting through all that red tape and it'll just be a five day application. Um, and, and that is coming, it's going to be announced this Monday. Thank you very much for that. Is that something that you'd welcome Ian? Yes. Uh, yeah, we need, there needs to be some kind of balance. We need to make sure that what happens happens safely. Mm. But we've been saying all along is, is for goodness sake, don't put businesses, with everything else they're having to do, don't make businesses have to do one more thing to make a licensing application or to make a, uh, something that, that we, can, we can work around. A lot of these, I think the proposal is a lot of these are temporary measures. So it may be for two months or three months that some of the uh, restrictions are lifted. Um, again, we've got to balance some of the concerns that residents might have, um, but yeah, in general, if places are going to open, then enable them to do that without having to put them, without them having to go through lots of red tape. Helen, just, just on that point, this is actually a real concern that I have, I think most operators have as well. So we've been in lockdown now for 12 weeks, and even if you're living in the city centre of Manchester, in the northern quarter, you could hear a pin drop. So all of a sudden, next Saturday, there's going to be noise outside, there's going to be chatter, people smoking, screaming, shouting, bins being emptied. And I have a real concern that residents might start phoning environmental health and things like that. And I, and I think, you know, I would ask residents to bear with us. Uh, I think Ian's right, these are temporary measures that are coming in, probably three months. Um, but you know, th at the moment the sector's on its knees and we do need everybody to come together. Yeah, well thank, thanks very much for making that point. And I, I guess that echoes what William was saying about, you know, it's, yes, it's great, it's great weather at the moment, but reopening everything all at once on a Saturday at this time of the year, when the weather's like this, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a, I guess there's a bit of risk with it as well. William, if I can come back to you again, um, what difference will the, one, the new one metre minimum rule make to the future success and sustainability of your pub estate? Uh, it's huge. Um, I know Emma's got some figures and I'm sure she'll want to comment on this as well. But the within our pub estate, you, you can a tenanted state is very hard to measure in true terms, but at two metres, I think it would have been a challenge for probably maybe up to half our estate to have opened in any viable form. That's not to say people wouldn't have tried to have opened, but it would have been a real tough challenge for them. At one metre, it does make life a lot easier it is not straightforward i hasten to add and the fact you know no standing at the bar everyone's going to have to work this one out and everyone's going to have to do a risk assessment they're all going to have to understand what that truly means so it's not going to be simple but it is possible and i think especially around the tenanted businesses they will licensing is very creative i think our industry is very creative and they will find ways to resolve this and there are other questions that have come in this week which i think are less predicted and more of a challenge. I think how and what is actually required around recording is a bit of a concern. So is that just if you book a table you record it or do we have to go further than that? And that presents all manner of challenges and, and also points of conflict and we don't want those. We don't need points of conflict in this time. We need everything to work as smoothly as we can do. But um, it, it is very good news. I mean without it I think the hospitality sector would have uh, it would have felt like a, a, a death blow for a number of businesses and a number of pubs before they even had a chance to get going. We do now enter an incredibly risky period for our sector. The next few months, whilst everyone was in difficult places, they could predict what difficult looked like. As we move through, Sasha's quite right, people may stay local. I'm a great believer there's going to be a very binary decision on this. It's either I'm going to the pub or I'm not going to the pub and convince me why I should come out of my house. I don't think it's going to be any more than that. And People will in time gain confidence. We do have to watch the first day because I worry that the media will grab hold of this and they'll look for some headlines that are, oh, look what's happened, look, it's all the big blowout and it's all this, which will not be a fair reflection on what we've tried to do. But it will be very, very hard for licensees across the country to manage that and just, we just need the customers to work with us and to be tolerant and understanding. But one meter was absolutely fundamental to the Ample Rio. I think without it, it almost wasn't going to be possible to do anything at a practical level. Emma, do you want to just come in on that and add to anything there? Yeah, no, at, at, at two meters, 
um, as it is today, that would have seen only a third of pubs opening. So we predicted that we'd see 75% if we get it down to one meter and we're gonna be closer to 80% of pubs opening. So that's the difference that the one meter uh, plus, you can't forget the plus, uh, the one meter plus makes, you know, the plus being the mitigation factors that we're gonna put in to keep our staff and our customers safe. Um, but the reason being is that businesses were simply not viable, either because of the reduction in physical capacity um, or, or just the fact they wouldn't be able to turn over enough customers within that space. So the capacity reduction we've asked our members even now will still be at 30 percent. That's where these initiatives to open up outdoor space help. They have to be an addition to what we're doing is to help replace the loss of capacity that we're seeing from inside um, internally and in our in our own garden spaces so that 30 percent is where, where we're taking the hit and while we may see that 80 percent open as i say it doesn't mean that the economy is going uh we've uh, done a, a poll you know 50 percent of them will be making a loss 10 percent will be making a profit and the rest will just be doing well to break even so even though we're open even though we're trading we're still going to take a long time to get back to profitability um, but the one meter was a good contribution towards a viability. It is. Next step is that confidence factor to get people to come back, to illustrate the safety mechanisms and, and the practices we're putting in place and make people feel it is a valuable and safe um, experience that they can, they can do again and again and again. Because I think many people will go out for a pint on Saturday, but we need people to come and feel comfortable to stay and then keep coming back. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And I guess, I guess a lot of this goes back to you know it's it's the it's the, the, the test track trace which comes which which brings us round to the fact that um, customer details uh, are going to uh, be required to be taken so that in the event that somebody did actually say that or, or find that they were suffering symptoms of coronavirus and indeed tested positive for it that it's all part of the test track and trace system. Um, just on on that point. Um, do we need customer agreement? Customer, somebody's asking, do we need customers' agreements to take and retain the details and to share them with track and trace? And what do we do if a customer refuses? Does, can anybody, I don't know which of the panel might be best served to answer that. None of us are lawyers. Um, I don't know where. But I, my understanding is the words legitimate interest play a pretty big role in this. If you book a table, you will provide a number, a contact number. That's not untypical. We will do it today. And what you're retaining is a phone number against a name. It's not details that I feel tip over any GDPR lines. Clearly, lawyers are going to look at this, but there's legitimate interest is the usual point here. I think if someone refuses to provide their details, you know, the, the, the hardest sanction a licensee has is to say, then regrettably, I don't feel I can serve you because this is about protecting the community. However, being clear about what it actually says, it says wherever possible, I think, or rather practical. So it's not an absolute requirement. But if people put their community hat on, and talking to Sasha's point about people staying local, this is about protecting communities. It's not actually necessarily about protecting one individual or another individual, and it's certainly not prying into their lives. It's about protecting communities. Yeah, we have significant concerns for the sector, I have to say, on this specific point. We've been working with the government on the guidance and the contact data being added in at a very late stage um, due to health concerns, the fact that the test and trace app wasn't working. Um, it, we are still working with the government and we're supposed to be part of the consultation. I've been waiting for that invitation for the last two days. It still hasn't arrived about how we're going to create this register. At the moment, they're indicating that it could be as simple as a paper register and that you would destroy that after two weeks. And that um, we have had um, some data collection in the Channel Islands where they've been trialing this. They've actually done away with all social distancing by now and data collection, but they would do doing that and uh, keeping a paper copy and then destroying it um, day by day after a two week retention. Um, obviously, we're being asked to keep that information for an extra week longer. Um, so we just need to be mindful of uh, the timelines that we're doing. But it is still um, unclear exactly what format the government are expecting us to collect that data in. Um, but at this point in time, I think, you know, we need, to, we need to be working with the government because we want to stay open. And if this has been the trade off to get us down to one meter is that we have to collect data. We have to find a practical way to do it. Yeah, yeah. 
it's, it's again it's a way of moving forward in a positive way um i think i've got a, qu a question here for uh for ian i think um in relation to customer seating and potential customer to customer spread um can i this is from tony can i ask ian if customer tables are one meter apart and only customers of the same group share a table would the fact customers aren't facing each other count as a mitigation of risk? And if this is not the case, tables would need to be two metres apart, which has serious implications and in many cases not workable. Right, okay. Um, I'm, I've got to apologise in advance and that I'm not that familiar with the guidance that I can quote it immediately. Uh, and I've also had to go onto a tablet so I can't access it. Um, I'm sorry, I'd have to get back on that point. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll come back on that. Apologies, I'll try and get it during the call. But um, yeah, without looking at the guidance, uh, I wouldn't want to speculate on what that would be. Okay, well, th thanks very much for that, Ian. Um, Okay, this is a question. This is a question sent in from I know what one of our one of our friends in Stockport, uh, and I'm going to put it to Emma. Um, Emma, the hospitality industry has been hit hard, and congratulations to Robinsons for their rent support for their publicans. Whilst the relaxation of lockdown is welcome, will the parameters associated with the relax relaxation add more costs, such as extra work service customers to an industry already struggling with profit margins i think you might have slightly touched on this but if you can just sort of go into this a bit more it'd be yeah, we, it, it was absolutely crucial that we got the date of the 4th of July locked in. Reason being, people have been on uh, unfurloughed, staff have been brought back in, mitigation factors were already been put in, people were buying screens, uh, whatever they needed to help m make the changes to their environment. And that we valued that that cost that had already been made for one third of the sector was worth 150 million. So if we missed that deadline, that was an extra cost on an industry that's had nothing coming in since March. And these all add up, all these costs keep adding up. So we had to get a way to get open on the 4th of July to make that investment valid. Um, the, the full uh, valuation for getting ready for reopening for the full sector is at 450 million. Now that on a sector that's has zero income is very, very difficult and it will take a long time to come back. So we've been making representations to the government about the, the level of investment that we're putting in to the sector and asking them to say, recognize this investment you've made, help us with incentives to get our business back up and running again, help us through this road to recovery, get us to profitability so that we can stand on our own two feet in the future. But there is an extreme amount of money that's been put in. Not every pub will be able to do that and afford it. And sadly, those pubs will probably remain closed. They simply won't be able to put in the mitigation factors or they physically can't deal with the space and the restrictions. So we still have pubs that will have no support coming in and no income coming in and no opportunity to reopen as well. So this is it's ongoing vigilance. Just because we have an opening date, it doesn't mean that we take our eye off the ball. We have to be making aware of all those investments that we put in, but it's going to take a long time for us to pay off those investments and a long time to get back to profitability. Thanks very much, Emma. Chris Wallins, I think he's, he's still uh, looking to maybe come back. Are you in? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, um, we'll do. Um, how, Sasha, can I ask, how might further development from government assist in ensuring we that we can sustain future growth and development and be better protected against any spikes in the outbreak of coronavirus? I think to date, most of the actions that have been taken have been taken on a UK-wide basis. Do you think that there is room for to take them on more on a regionalised, localised basis? I think the simple answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, you know, we we people in Greater Manchester, our leaders in Greater Manchester, know our city region far better than people down in Westminster. So we should be given more powers up here. We really should. And I, I know it won't be uh, a popular thing to possibly say, but the, you know, the R rate is different in the Northwest than the rest of the country. Uh, I think the Southwest as well, it's slightly higher. So, um, you know, our, our Mayor Andy Burnham did actually say perhaps it was too early to, for the 4th of July. But they put this blanket across the whole of the UK uh, and, it, and it's happening now. So we just have to make the best of it and put as many measures in place as we can. Um, I forget who said it, but I, I, I think Emery may have been you, but uh, the customer here plays a huge part in this, an absolutely huge part. Um, more importantly than the operator. 
sector because we're all very aware that you can go into a venue socially distance at one meter with completely the best intentions but three pints in um and you start to loosen up a little bit so you know i think it's the customer now who can make or break this industry thank you very much for that i think michelle hayes from our audience she's a health and safety expert she's just actually said in here that seating people groups back to back one plus meters apart is acceptable the concern is around customers moving around eg going to the toilet which is it's quite it's quite understandable isn't it as people passing by um another question here for um that's for william um in the guidance that I was looking at today, it was mentioned that table service would be required within venues. But upon re reading it again, it, it doesn't seem to be compulsory. What, what sort of, um, are, you, are you looking at being able to provide a table service or a bar service? Or what, what sort of, again, to, to build confidence in your customers, what kind of, what kind of approaches and measures are you taking? Uh, we've uh, invested in a, a sort of app over Wi-Fi for one of better terms because you log into our Wi-Fi and our managed pubs you will be able to order from uh, your table to the bar um, we're launching that so as with all new launches we're going to launch it in a phase way across the managed estate and hopefully that's something for the future you can look at menus etc on it uh, we're also doing disposable you know one-off menus on paper that you can and will be uh, thrown away at the end of each one it's so dependent on where it is, but by and large, the guidance, and let's be clear, this is guidance, is that you should offer order at table and restrict use of bar. We suspected this would be the case, and we planned always around that, feeling like the right thing to do both protect the customer and, and equally protect our staff, because they are the guys who, the customer can turn up at the door and think, I don't fancy it today, and leave. A member of staff is there and is there for their shift, and we need to look after them, we need to support them. Um, I think there will be simpler solutions. The least and lowest tech solution is probably, you know, someone literally buys a pay-as-you-go phone, sticks on the tables. If you want to order, text it, bring it to you. There are creative ways. There are, you know, pens and paper and walk around. I think we're all going to learn this way. The main message we've tried to give our licensees is be very, very careful what cash you part with at this moment in time, because cash will be very precious. And if you can find creative, low-cost solutions to the questions posed by the guidance, that's what you should do because equally the guidance may well change. What we've chosen is long-term investment that suits our managed estate. It wouldn't suit a lot of our tenanted pubs. And I do think there will be very creative ways to do it that both protect staff and also give customers confidence and the service we want to provide. Service is key. And I guess all this is going to involve as time goes on, I think, you know, that there, there probably will become a time when we actually sort of have to give notification maybe to to a, a, a pub or a manager that we're actually intending to come that evening and, and what drinks do we have and, and is, there, is there somewhere we can sit and is, is that going to be something that you're going to be thinking of in the future as well? Let's wait and see, Helen. It's so hard to predict the future until we've been open and until we know how people are going to react to it. Can I just come in here, Helen? Sorry, I asked this directly of the government yesterday. Pre-booking is not necessary. It is not required. You can do it. Most venues will be making an offer for bookings, but you can still walk in if they have room. You'll obviously be queuing. They'll be greeted at the door and you'll have to just take a risk that you'll be able to get in. But that, that is definitely within the context of it. And on table service, it says they must have table service where possible. So there is flexibility in and around it. The point being they want to maintain consumption indoors seated so um, and limit the amount of crossover of wandering around so um, vertical drinking inside is dissuaded <laughs> that's the way that we should say we should be dissuading vertical drinking the consumption really should be at a seated and then there's flexibility in and around what defines table service therein and at this time of the year obviously any outdoor space is greatly appreciated <clears throat> just to reduce that even more um, I've got a question here from uh, from one of our guests um, out there today has there been any guidance on risk assessment from the government does this have to be carried out by a professional and submitted to planning etc what are, what are the, the rules and, and the guidance around carrying out a risk assessment prior to opening so just um, on, on that point we actually put out risk assessments a couple of weeks ago for people to have a look at and yesterday you know for the smaller 
one-man band, smaller venues, smaller independents. They are quite costly, some of these risk assessments to bring the firm in. So we were kindly donated a risk assessment by Avuna. We've got four restaurants, I think, across Greater Manchester. And yesterday we downloaded that into the resource bank. So if anybody wants to have a look at that, it's there free of charge. And I think they paid a couple of grand for it, so it's a good saving. Right, that's super. Just yeah, that's fine, Sorry, after Ian. Uh, yeah, the, the guidance that was released yesterday by the government, I think the, the way that it's been drafted is almost like a you can work your way through it. That's what we'd be looking for. Again, from an enforcement point of view, the, the key thing is, have you carried out a risk assessment? And it's done in a way that people will be able to do it themselves if they follow those steps in the guidance. It might seem a bit daunting, and yes, some people will commission somebody to do it for them. But my take on it was that it's written in a way that if you work your way through that document, you should have a good understanding of how things are going to work for you in your business. Yeah. I think also, if anybody's got access to the SK Business Recovery website, there is some information about carrying out a risk assessment in the template on there as well. Sorry, Emma, you were going to come back. No, but I know it's just to say um, that we've also done a template at the BBPA with iAuditor, who have partnered with us to deliver that. So we also have a solution if people want to do that even outside of, of the sector, they'd be welcome to. To, to work with them on that. Um, in terms of that risk assessment, Ian's right. If you go through those 39 points of mitigation, it's just assessing that you've done it. There's actually also a poster that needs to be displayed in a customer facing area. So either in a window, at the door, on the wall where lots of your customers will, will see it and maybe perhaps on the way to the bathroom, that that needs to be displayed. That, that risk assessment saying, poster saying we've carried out a risk assessment is set already it is downloadable from the guidance and so that's already there for you as well great thank you very much for that um just have a look. oh who, who ian this is probably another one for you i'm afraid who is going to monitor compliance of venues being covid secure um is there going to, are there going to be any forms of inspection are there likely to be random inspections around around areas could you give us any information on that please um we are awaiting guidance on enforcement but what i can do is tell you how it's worked previously with uh, enforcement so far we haven't been proactively inspect, um, carrying out inspections. Uh, we've been mainly responding to complaints. Um, that's been the main way that we've worked. The guidance that came out from, from government, it was similar to the police model, which is very much about educate, um, encourage, engage, and ultimately enforce. So the bulk of our work has been sending information to businesses to say, look, this is what you need to do. Um, and then, in cases where that wasn't happening, we followed that up initially by phone or email advice. Because again, we've got to bear in mind that we're an employer, we've got to look after the welfare of our staff. So some of the way that we would previously have worked on routine inspection, we've had to reconsider. Um, so that's been the approach, has been to educate people, to engage. I've got to say within stock, but I think it's worked very well. Um, I've had, I know of only one or two cases where we've had to go to any kind of formal process because by and large businesses want to do this they know that they've got to look after their staff they've got to look after their customers so for me it, it doesn't feel like one where we'll be sending people in just to see what's happening that's just adding a bit of another risk in terms of those premises and our staff so yes will we get complaints we'll respond uh, i see that as being a, a sensible way of enforcing rather than sending people into businesses um, who are going to have enough to cope with, to be honest, without somebody from enforcement turning up on day one just to see how things are. Thank you very much for that. I think that has been a concern of, of, of some people. Um, just a quick one here. I think we may have covered this before, but just in case, Susanna's asking, will cafes not taking bookies, bookings need to collect customer details for track and trace? Yes, I think it, they will. Yeah. Yes, I think they will. I think the uh, the requirement under the um, the guidance is that places that are open take details. I don't think I can check, but I don't think it exempts cafes from that. 
And, it's not and I guess thing. also, yeah, I guess also if you sort of, if the cafe owners put up a message, going back to what William was saying about it, you know, wherever possible, we're doing all this to protect our community, our neighbours, to protect everyone. So I guess if the messaging is right, it will be easier for people to actually sort of really give away that, give that information, especially if they know what it's going to be used for. Yeah. Um, I think the Go on, carry on. I was just going to come back on a point on this. From the, um, I'm also involved in some of the track and tracing work for an environmental health point of view. And what public health colleagues are saying is that this is not just a bit of bureaucracy. This is not just we want to know who's out drinking. It's really serious because uh, as the track and trace develops, it's likely that well, sorry, people will test positive. And some of the questioning may be, may be where have you been in the last 14 days? And if somebody's been in a pub or a restaurant, that's somewhere that they'll want to have a way of identifying who was there at the time the person who's positive was. So that's the, um, the message that they're stressing is this is not some kind of big brother. We want to keep tabs on people. It's just, look, we're going to have outbreaks in the future. We need to be able to tackle those outbreaks as well as we can. Again, it's going back to keeping the community safe, isn't it? And, and again, giving extra confidence, I suppose. Um, I think, William, if I can come back to you, and um, we're just probably coming up towards the last question now, but I was reading today that these the new measures may have to be implemented until the uh, spring of next year. Is, is that, have you heard that? Is that true? And if so, is that sustainable for your business? I mean, I think the new measures are going to be in place as long as they need to be in place. And I, I don't think we've predicted a time to it or a date on it. Um, guidance is changing all the time. I would expect guidance will continue to evolve. We're just going to need to be creative and adapt with it. I think it's been da it'll be dangerous to work towards a date that you think it will all change on because you'll either be wildly overexcited or hugely disappointed. I think we genuinely understand and we will find which pubs are capable of trading under these current rules, which aren't. And I'm sure then we will, with the support of the likes of Emma and her team at the BBPA, we will go back to government and say, this is working, this isn't, this might work better if it was possible. But it will come down to actually where the coronavirus is in the general public and what the effect is on our hospital sector and the ability of healthcare to cope with the demand. Uh, you know, we're going to have to sit this one out. I mean, that's why we talk about this being a two year, 18 months, two year, three year timeline. We don't know. Over this winter period is going to be a, a time none of us have ever lived through anything like this. We can't predict what will happen. If there's a local spike, if a local lockdown, what does that mean for us? And yes, we're all going to take some more bruises through this. And that's why I describe this next period as an incredibly dangerous and difficult period for the hospitality sector. You know, we've, we've walk, we're walking out of a door into one room, into another room. We don't know how big that room is and we don't know when we'll exit it. But, you know, we're just going to have to keep plugging on and doing the right thing and providing the right service for our customers. Next step, you know, working with government, we're going to need to try to talk to them about rules that need changing and guidance needs adapting as time moves on. I can't give a, I can't give a clear answer. I don't think there is one. No, no, that, that's, 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 that's fine. Um, and just very finally, um, I think probably again, this is for Ian. In relation to staff protection, who should I contact regarding the supply of FFP3 masks for hospitality staff in the Stockport area? Ian, can you give Sorry, me advice was, on that? I missed the, missed the full question. Somebody wants to know... Where About people... FFP3 face masks. Right. Uh, I don't know um, who the supply will be there. Okay. To be honest, Mark, if you'd like to drop us in, we'll make sure that we get back to you yeah. on that one. Uh, on that question. Um, I think, um, Sasha, an anonymous attendee, when do you think events might start to happen again? Let's try and finish on a positive note. Well, don't ask me that question then. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is, there is, there's a, a you know, there's a huge difference between indoor events and outdoor events. Um, I'm lucky enough to be in, in a WhatsApp group of uh, other nighttime economy advisors across the globe. So I'm, I think it's 39 in total. I'm seeing everything that's happening in Australia, New Zealand, India, Lithuania, some in the States. Some places doing really good jobs, some doing very bad jobs. Portugal, 
um, are looking, I think, from the 24th of October to do outdoor events from 5,000 capacity and above, as are Spain. Um, so that gives you an idea. Uh, talking about warehouse projects with my warehouse project cap on, we normally start at the end of September. We're not expecting that. We're not expecting October. I think we'd be lucky to see something end of November, December, um, if, if that. We're very, very confident. Park life, 8,000 people, we're now booking that. So we're confident with that. But who knows? You know, as William said, and I really liked it because I haven't heard it before, we're... we're leaving one room, walking into another room. Who knows what the future is? There could be a second wave. Um, so, yeah, only time will tell. But I think outdoor events, from what I'm seeing, most things are now, uh, and events in general, most things are now postponed for Q4. Uh, Q1, Q2 is going to be very, very busy. Um, and, and ironically, actually, there aren't enough stadiums for the big tours for Q1, Q2, which I've never seen before. Uh, you know, things like the Harry Styles tour that was rescheduled. Their people are running out of space. They're scrambling for more space. Um, so it's going to be a very, very busy year next year. Thanks. So to use William's, um, William's words, then we, we, we're going through the room and let's hope that we've got sort of some pleasantries on when we, as we enter the new room, whatever, they, whatever that's going to look like. Can I just say thank you, everybody, for, for, to the panel for participating today, for all the guests for attending today. We hope you found that useful and um, goodbye. Thank you.